Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Shalene Johnson, and today I am filming from uh, an apartment where my husband and I are staying in New York City for a month. It's one of the things we've had on our bucket list for forever, and it's like really cool to be able to do that. But as you might be able to hear, that it like New York City is loud. So please excuse any horns honking or buzzers beeping that you might hear in the background. Today, I am going to talk to a plastic surgery patient advocate. Her name is Melinda Farina and she is the most renowned plastic surgeon advocate that, that's available. Like she consults with Hollywood. She consults with anyone who's interested in getting a plastic surgery procedure and realizes that this is a very important, very significant decision. And the information that's available to the average person um, just doing a Google search isn't enough as I learned the hard way. Even if you're a great researcher, even if you have checked this surgeon's credentials and you've talked to past patients and you've looked at reviews and you've checked to see if their credentials are still in good standing, you still don't know for sure what it is you're getting. Melinda today will share with us her expertise and how it is she selects surgeons. She's going to answer all of your best questions like about injectables versus doing surgeries. Um, should you go to someone who just specializes in nose jobs or just specializes in BBLs, whatever it is that you're considering doing? What about combining procedures? And most importantly, what do we need to ask? What do we need to know when we ourselves are trying to find a reputable so not just a reputable surgeon, but someone who's going to give us the result that we desire. Making the decision to have plastic surgery is not something everybody agrees with, but it is your option and it's your choice. And I, I don't regret that I've had plastic surgery. I regret that I didn't meet someone like Melinda beforehand to actually help me understand who it was I was going under the knife with. Melinda can be reached by going to her website, which is thebeautybrokers.com. You can also follow her on Instagram. She talks about a couple of different really important reputable uh, reporting agencies that you might need to look into, and we will link to those in our show notes below. Um, this is a great conversation. She's honest. There's no BS. Uh, she doesn't take any payment from the doctors. She is the advocate for the patients. Without further ado, here's Melinda. As of like the past three weeks when everyone was tagging me on all of your stories, I'm like, okay, I need to follow every single detail of this oh story because this is just outrageous. I'm so sorry. Well, thanks. I assume in the line of work that you do, you, you're like, I've heard it all. Like, so I have heard it all. And, and this is not, um, you know, uncommon, which is the scary part of that. There's many, many, many incidents like this that happen across the world. Um, and we see it a lot in the United States. I mean, I'm primarily a United States based consultant patient advocate. Um, but we are, I mean, when these things come my way, I'm always outraged by it. But it's amazing how little people know, you know, about where to go, who to report to the proper institutions to contact. Um, and mostly, you know, people are going on these online applications or, you know, um, platforms like real self and these patient you know the doctor review sites where it's like whose best interests do they actually have the patients or the doctors so you always have to question who's the people behind these platforms you know what like how do they function how do they run their business and usually you know it's a pay to play mm -hmm. so they have to be very careful about that those are not the proper institutions to go and like running off to reporting all the bad behavior to because they, they could easily just be taken off of these platforms right right well I'm really excited to dig into this. I know my audience is too, because I have sufficiently scared every single woman who listens to my podcast, who's like, was considering a minor tweak or whatever. I've sufficiently scared everyone. And that wasn't my intention. Although I'm, I'm happy that people are much more skeptical and that they, you know, I think that we've drawn a light to the fact that you frankly just can't trust review sites. You can't trust the necessarily what you're reading about a doctor. You can't even trust your own research. So if I can start today by sharing with our audience a little bit about your background, like how did you get to this position where you've got this level of expertise and knowledge? What was your right. inspiration? Right. So I never wanted to be a surgeon. I always wanted to be a consultant. So I knew that from the very, very beginning. And in doing so, and in, in consulting, you just have to gather 
a lot of wisdom and expertise from many, many, many of like the key opinion leading surgeons. So my goal from the very beginning was to surround myself with the best. I actually started off in dental school because I thought I wanted to be a dentist. And then I quickly realized like, no, that really wasn't the way I wanted to go. My back was always hurting me. Um, <laughs> so I, I switched my uh, major over to organizational psychology, just because I knew that in building a consultancy, organizational psychology was a great major to, to have behind you. Um, you just kind of know personalities and what personalities, you know, suit certain businesses and certain practices. So to understand how to structure a practice. And I got into, I got really into business management consulting in the very beginning, which then switched over to patient advocacy and patient consulting. But I mean, I started from the age of 13 working with doctors. So I'm in my forties now, and it's been a very long time that I've been working with doctors in the ORs, chair side, spending a lot of time with them, asking a million questions, traveling around the world, meeting with surgeons from all over the world. And um, I developed my, my consultancy when I was 21 years old. And um, I've had the consultancy wow. for a long time now, and it just keeps building and getting better and better and better. And of course, when you're young, you make all the mistakes. And you know, as a businesswoman, when you first build a business, you make mistakes, you learn from them, and then you build better. So, um, so that's basically what this consultancy has turned into. In the beginning, we, and I did a lot of um, PR back then where I was like doing a lot of magazine articles and I didn't, I wasn't PR trained. I didn't know what to say, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, that wasn't my, my goal. My goal was really to get out there and be known as the advocate. Like I'm going to work for you, the patient. Um, the business model has changed multiple times. Originally we were a doctor. It was a doctor of membership. So doctors would okay. actually pay us. And then I realized like that really takes away from the trust of, of the client. So I need to stop this business model and change it. And now it's doctors don't pay us. We don't wow. work for the doctor. We only work for the patient. I work for my client. Um, it's an unbiased referral all the time. And I choose the doctors. And I can't tell you how many times doctors come to us saying, how do we work with you? You know, you, you work with all these phenomenal surgeons. I think I'm a great surgeon. And I'm like, well, that's up for me too to basically decipher whether or not I want to work with you. So I choose who I want to work with, but we look for consistencies and our vetting processes oftentimes take about two years in order for me to work with a surgeon. I like to spend a lot of time with them. I like to talk to their clients. I like to go into the ORs and see the work that they're doing. And I watch their behavior on these social media platforms if they're on there. Um, most of my surgeons are not even a part of social media. Really? So, you know, the exceptional surgeons don't need to do this. Um, many younger surgeons are choosing to use social media now. It's a great tool. It's a good tool to get out there. But most excellent surgeons do well and are successful via word of mouth. Do you find that, um, and that's interesting you should say that, because I think the public's perception is, and I know this is true for any industry, if someone has a lot of followers, well, then they by proxy have expertise. If someone has um, is internationally known because they have such a huge social media platform, I think there's just this umbrella credential that we give to people uh, where we believe, gosh, if they've got this many followers and everyone knows their name, they must be the best. Right, but that's assuming. And you know what happens when people assume, right? <laughs> so yeah. you don't want to assume. You got to practice some discernment when choosing your surgeon. At the end of the day, it's your face, it's your body. You're doing this one time. So I kind of like the stuffy doctors who are like ultra nerds, you know, who really don't put on the show. They're not acting like the Wayne Brady's and Bob Barker's of social media. We don't want to work with doctors like that. Leave that to the actors. Leave that to mm. entertainment. This mm. is medicine. You know, this is not entertainment. So I'm not looking for someone to come out calling themselves like a, a nickname, Dr. Miami, Dr. Laguna, whatever they're going to call themselves. That's silly and it's stupid. And that's not someone who I would want to trust my face or body in the hands of. I'm sorry. That behavior alone is so off-putting. Yeah. I would never even consider working with somebody like that. And, you know, this is something that I think about in retrospect now with regard to my own situation is the personality of someone who seems to be more focused on their fame and notoriety than they right. are their, their craft or their patient. Well, that's ego. So again, who's whose best interest do you have at heart? You know, the doctors basically has his own best interest at heart, his own ego, his own fame and fortune. And that is also not somebody who you want to go to 
and put your and entrust your face and body in the hands of. You want to go to the surgeon who's going to spend an hour and a half with you, educating you, pulling out the textbooks, breaking down all of you know the techniques, where exactly those incisions are going to be, talking about all the intrinsic details of the procedure. The guy who is going to call you every single day after your procedure. The the anesthesiologist who's going to be a professional and act like a professional and call you the night before and ask and go mm. down the list of questions mm. with you and not make those like disgusting comments, you know, when you go in for your post-op. That is not an office. That is not a professional practice. And that is not someone you want to trust your face and body in the hands of. So tell me, what does your, because so many people reach out to me and said, like, again, I'm just terrified now, but I really also want to have this done. Please help me understand how, what would a situation like this look like? How is it you advocate for patients? So if someone reaches out to your, your company, what does that process look like? Right. So they would email us and they would get Gianna, my admin, who would set them up with a consultation appointment. Right now we're booked out about seven months in advance. I do about 15 consultations a day. So we're pretty booked up and we're booked into, yeah, we're booked pr pretty much into June right now, I think. Um, wow. But we talk for one hour with the client. I have them fill out an intake form. They send photos. I take a look at the photos. I take a look at the case specifications. They send photos in five-year increments so I could see how they've aged and what the aging progression has been. Um, mm. And then we look at those very specific details of the case and we match them with the surgeon that is right for their case, that is well-suited for their case, who specializes in their case specifications. I try to match personality. I try to match budget. I try to match location. Sometimes we do have patients travel. Um, but I always try to, it's a matchmaking service of sorts. Mm, and yeah. I really try to put you in the hands of the doctor who's going to be best suited for your case. So I take a look at what that doctor's best cases are. And I really study those case specifications. Okay. He's very specific with you know, Caucasian thin skin women who have a lot of sun damage, you know, say for like a facelift. He really excels in that, you know, area. So I usually like to match that type of patient with that doctor, or this patient is overweight, has very, very thick skin, ethnic skin, oily skin, um, a lot of heaviness in the submentum, needs a lot of lifting, needs a different type of an approach, maybe a deep plane approach, and we put them with the proper surgeon for that. So I really break it down into the case specifications. That's why I don't wow. like to name drop on my page. A lot of people get very frustrated with that. I put up photos, I put up cases, so you could see the outcome. Um, but I don't put up the doctor's names. Again, I don't work for the doctor. I work for my client. I love so, it. So, you know, that, that's the reason why we don't put that up there. But that's amazing, actually. I mean, understand. just the way that you, the, the amount of time that you spend thinking about just, I would have never thought that you need to consider ethnicity and skin type and 100%. how you age. I would have never thought about that. Aesthetic style. You know, they all have this like aesthetic style and you have to also relate to that. And then you also have to take a look at the majority of their cases. Are you similar to the before case? Because, you know, you have to look at the before and the after. Um, mm -hmm. If your case, you know, if you're not looking at someone who has an identical case situation as you do, but you're looking at their results and saying, oh, yes, that's what I want. And, it, and the original before case looks nothing like your own. You're not going to get that after result. So people need to realize that too. And, I, and that's a huge mistake I see a lot of people make. It's like basically like um, Miley Cyrus going and asking to look like Selena Gomez. You know, they have two different aesthetics. <laughs> so yeah, you true. can't get that outcome if you, your, your beginning point is not, you know, quite identical to that other person's. Let me ask you about um, our thinking when it comes to plastic surgery and money. I, I know that people price shop when they're looking for a physician, right. sometimes like they have a certain amount of money that they have set aside or, or even to consider using a service like yours. Speak to the woman right now. Who's like, you know, I'm, I'm saving up every penny that I have to do this facelift, to do this tummy tuck, to do this breast lift, whatever it is. And, um, she's thinking to herself, I, I can't afford to hire a consultant because I'm saving every single penny I have to do this procedure. 
Right. Well, I mean, consultant hiring me, it's not expensive to, to work with me. My consultations are 385 or 550 in, for an in-person. So it's very affordable. If you could afford Gosh. plastic surgery, you could afford a consultant. And that can I say five- on your behalf that you can't afford not to do that? Um, right. literally, right. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many dozens and dozens and dozens of women I've talked to who spent thousands and thousands of money out of pocket because yeah. they were hospitalized due to infections and the revisions and the scar treatments that they've had to undergo. And I mean, it, the list goes on and on the expenses right. that they've incurred because they didn't have someone to advocate for them because they weren't, I want to say they didn't do their research, but they, a lot of these women did their research. It's just not available to us. Research is smoke and mirrors these days. You have to be really careful. You know, it's better. And, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm not my own horn tutor. I'm tired. I work a lot. So <laughs> the more work for me, not the merrier really. Uh-huh. Um, but I think that right now there's so much smoke and mirror marketing with social media, with the internet, with these review sites, and they look at it for monetary gain. You know, you're really the, the owners of these sites. I mean, for, for example, the guy who started Real Self is a Wall Street executive. Come on, Tom Siri. you know, I mean, nice guy, but you're a Wall Street executive. What are you really starting this platform for? You know, he's looking at it as like dollar signs, which I think it started off with the right intentions, but now they're really protecting the surgeons. They're protecting the doctors. They're not protecting the patients. And, you know, then I have to play devil's advocate and look at it this way. Anyone and, and everyone could just write a review your competitor, if I was a doctor, my competitor could write a review about me and you have no idea, you know, they're going on there with an alias. So, so how are they really, you know, judging or how do they know who's an actual patient versus who's a competitor versus who's just a hater, you know, so there's a lot of that on these review sites too. There's an easy fix to that. I think anyone who wants to leave a review needs to send a screenshot of their, or, you know, an attachment of their actual receipt that they've easy. actually been a patient. I mean, it's such an easy, so simple. That. I've, I've noticed that many of the simple. reviews. So the uh, surgeon that I went to Dr. Arian Malavi, um, 210 of his Yelp reviews are hidden. And I noticed that the ones that remain that are negative anyways, are those that have photos attached, which is why I was certain to attach photos, even though at that time I didn't, when I wrote my review, I hadn't even taken off my bandages. I I didn't even know really what I was dealing with in terms of the scars that would need to be revised and um, the length of my scar, et cetera. But I think because I did post up photos, um, that Yelp review is still there. But with regard to a site like Real Self, my and this is just what I'd heard from other people, um, them saying like, oh, real self is the place where you go other than Yelp, where you can actually see real reviews and hear what patients are saying about it. Later, I find out that um, many of people who left reviews on real self, th- those reveals aren't, reviews are not there. And this, no particular, there. this particular doctor is on their board of directors. And he's, he, he's the first person that comes up as like the expert in this area. Right. There's another um, female surgeon who's on their board of directors, too, who we see a lot of botch cases from based out of New York. Um, You know, I never, you know, and then you kind of wonder, like, how do they have such rave reviews? And why am I seeing one of their clients every or one of their patients every single week? You know, I think there's pluses and minuses to everything. And I think there's corruption in every single industry across the board. And so you see a lot of this garbage happening. You know, I, I don't like to take away from a site like Real Self because I think there's so many great things about it. But I think they, they, they have a lot of work they need to do and, you know, to make it an actual legitimate, legitimate site, to make it a trustworthy site, um, they could call me. I could help them with that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you could. But, I wish they you know, would. Again, honesty, honesty is the best policy. And, and that's how I was raised. You know, my mother always said, like, don't lie. Like, it's going to catch up with you. So yes. You know, I was raised to be an honest professional and the doctors who I work with, my mentors were honest professionals who were by the book and, and they trained me and they basically molded me into the professional who I am today. And I still work with them to this day. And actually I'm getting my own breast lift with one of them in New York in three weeks from now. And I can't wait. Um, he, he's wonderful. His name is Dr. Jonathan Sherwin, but you know, it's, um, it's amazing how things have changed with social media. I just feel like a lot of these doctors put on a show and a lot of these review sites are like, okay, how could like, you know, capitalize. And 
a lot of these review sites have also taken in major investments, $40 million investments, you know, and they now have investors like watching their every move. So it's like, okay, how could we bring more money in? And this is like a money machine now. So they lose their legitimacy and they lose that, that, that trust factor. And this happens a lot with a lot of these sites. How, would you, how is it you would describe the average person believes that they should be picking a plastic surgeon? And then let's talk about what they actually should be doing. I mean, board certification matters, right? But I mean, what does that say? This guy is also a board certified surgeon. So and, I mean, and do you, do you find that the average person actually even looks that up or calls to find out if they uh, are in, in no, good standing? No, I think people are visual. And if this is a visual industry and we are on visual platforms. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are choosing their doctor based on photos. Mm. You know, they're not really even going to their website. They're not reading about their, I mean, the majority of people, there are really well-researched women out there. I mean, I am shocked sometimes when I get on a call with one of my clients, I'm just like, wow, you know more than I do about this surgeon. <laughs> That's, That's phenomenal. Awesome. Um, yeah. You're a well-researched individual. You're a professional. Uh, you've, you've had tremendous success. You know how to research people. I mean, Again, you chose the surgeon, you got a less than desirable result, and you had a bad experience. I don't know why that happened. Um, and I'm sure you don't know why that happened. And I'm sure this is something you've gone over in your head millions of times saying, how, how me of all people did, yeah. did I get to this point? Yeah. But um, you do, you, you need to do your research, read about them, understand where they did their fellowship, who are their mentors, what was their training, um, where did they go to school? You know, when you go in for a consultation, they're not interviewing you, you're interviewing the surgeon. So go with a list of questions, go deep, ask them a lot of questions about their training, even if they're, you know, 30 years into it, you still want to know, are you going to all the meetings, you know, are you staying up to date with all the latest technologies. Um, these are questions you want to ask them. Also, you know, for me, I don't like going to a surgeon who runs a fellowship because I know damn well. What does that mean? Have... Explain that to me. So a lot of doctors run fellowship programs. There's, they have to be granted the fellowship, but it, it is a program where basically a junior doctor out of their res residency could go and spend one year with the surgeon and train with them um, and basically learn and, and be mentored by the surgeon and learn all of their techniques. It's called the fellowship. And not a lot of doctors run them. They're, I mean, there are surgeons who run them, but there's not like a tremendous amount. Um, but most times, a lot of these doctors running fellowships allow their junior doctors to work on their patients. I see this often, and that's a, a major no-no for me. So, um, <laughs> so I personally don't go to surgeons who run these fellowships, or I ask them, hey, you're, I'm choosing you as my surgeon, I don't want your, your fellow working on me. And I want someone there. I want someone there to witness this as well. Is it your understanding that a doctor has to disclose that they're working with the fellowship or that another surgeon might be doing part of your surgery? I think 100% they should be disclosing this information. 100%. They should be, but are they required to? They should be required to. That's actually a good question that I don't know the answer to. So they should be required to. You know, again, the laws are so loose in this industry. What you sign, how they could take away your First Amendment rights. Like, it's unbelievable to me. It literally. What is. is in some of these contracts sometimes? Come into your appointment, after being well-researched, understanding who it is you're meeting with and their credentials, et cetera. And then you describe interviewing them. And I just... I, I want to point out the fact that we have this, um, th since we've been born, most of us have been taught to respect authority. And right. I can see how women would feel or men might feel really intimidated or that it's inappropriate to go into the uh, expert and then interview them and question their credentials and that we might offend them. What advice do you have for that woman who's like, oh, I'm worried about offending my doctor if I ask them these questions? They shouldn't be offended. These are, are natural questions to ask, right? They shouldn't be offended. And if they are, run, run for the hills. You should get out of there. I mean, these are these are great questions to ask and they should be able to answer them confidently and not be offended while you're like, you know, for, for you asking, oh, well, my reputation should precede me. No, we're taking this from like square one. You don't know me. I don't know you. Let's get to know each other. This is a getting to know you process. 
let's talk about um, specific procedures. Most women, and I shouldn't say most women, I assume that many women think if I'm going to go under the knife, I should probably do this and this, you know, the kind of combined procedures. And there are certain doctors, for example, the, the doctor who I went to, who I've since learned it's kind of the way he operates is he doesn't want you to be on his table unless he's doing everything like head to toe. And then well, surgeries are really extensive. And, um, but let's just speak to the woman who's like, you know, I want to have a, a breast lift and a tummy tuck done at the same time. What are your thoughts on combining procedures? Right. So breast lift tummy tuck is a typical mommy makeover procedure. There are mommy makeover specialists out there that do really well with abdominoplasties and breast lifts, mastopexies, um, mastopexy reductions. So you have to really take a look at the work, right? Are they consistent with this? Are they just good with the breast lift or are they also good with the abdominoplasty? So when you're combining those two, you have to make sure that there's consistency with their results across the board. The biggest issue with abdominoplasties, which is what he did on you, um, and you went in for a revision of your of your t of your C-section scar, which is this long. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to revise that, they have to cut that out. But you can't just cut out that little piece and pull skin down. So you have to extend that incision. He didn't explain that to you. Maybe had he explained it to you, you would have chosen not to do that procedure, knowing that you would right. have a hip to hip scar. Correct. Right. Right. Um, so you know, bad on him for not explaining that correctly to you. But you know, when I, I did my own research before going to see him and looking, I, I looked at so many different plastic surgery sites, basically educational sites about the different types of ways I could have that scar revised. And, and they would actually show um, a C-section scar and then they would show a mini tuck being like, you know, a couple of inches wider and then a full tummy tuck. And, and so like all these sites, in addition to what he shared with me in the office, which, which was, it will be wider. It will, sorry, it will be longer, not wider. Mm -hmm. It will be longer by about an inch or so on each side was how he described it. So I fully expected to have like a six to seven inch scar. Um, Depends on how much skin laxity you had to pull down. So if there was, a, you know, again, no two cases are, are alike. So it really depends on, on the laxity of the skin, on, you know, how wide you are hip to hip. And then bringing that skin down, if he maybe thought like, okay, I could do an inch on both sides. And then he went to re to drape that skin. And then all of a sudden you have a dog ear on both sides mm. of that incision. You have to kind of chase that dog ear across until you get it straight down. And that happens sometimes, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. that's a judgment call they need to make during the surgery. Um, so and that's really like a, a no fault for the doctor. He doesn't want you walking around with dog ears, but also you know, it's something that he should have explained, hey, you know, when I go into redrape, again, it's all in the execution of the information. Some of these yeah. guys are just sloppy with their execution and are not very thorough with, you know, their explanation and what might happen. Okay, you know, there might be a chance I might have to pull that skin down and there might be a dog ear and I might have to just extend that scar a little bit more because I don't want you to have a dog ear. But again, when you have this ego and you have this way of executing information and it's quick and sloppy, you're not going to get that information across. He's more concerned about like being a superstar on Instagram than he is about, you know, getting that proper information across to his client. What is your thoughts? Is there a particular procedure that um, you really need to go to someone who that's almost all that they do? Like, for example, a nose, a nose job or a, a facelift, eyes? Yeah. Just curious. I'm a big believer in niche specializing. Um, doctors don't like to be pigeonholed, you know, into a corner with one specialty. They're like, no, I went to school for this, this and that. I don't want to just be known for this one thing. But if you notice, most doctors who specialize in one thing are the really the most famous surgeons out there. Um, mm. The guys who just do facelifts, the ones who just do rhinoplasties. They're well known for it. They're extremely successful. Um, and I think they really get to master their craft. When you dilute yourself with everything, you, you're like a jack of all trades, but a master of none. You know, yeah, so yeah. we don't want that. Um, I've heard you reference injectables and you're not a big fan of women trying to change their facial structure with injectables. I, I do injectables probably once a year. Um, I try to be very modest in using them, but share with us some of your thoughts on why you, you're, it is, if I'm not mistaken, it's your recommendation that women should just wait and do a, a maybe a, a very modest lower facelift instead of doing injectables. 
Right. So <laughs> there's so much controversy around my, you know, my thoughts with injectables. I have chosen to be an injectable free consultancy. I just don't think long term that the filler is going to sustain a patient's aesthetic. I have also, and we also have a group called Core Aesthetics that's led by Dr. Kami Parsa. Um, and we did a, like a huge symposium one day on it. And we had all doctors from all around the world talking about fillers and filler complications and how the body just doesn't break down these high, like um, by cross, high lacrosse fillers anymore. The molecules are now, you know, crossed with other molecules and the button, they're like large filler molecules that the body cannot break down. So, you know, there, there's issues there. First of all, they, people stack, they stack fillers, they stay mm. in the dermis, they, you know, the body's not breaking it down, they migrate, they stagnate lymphatics, they compress fat, they stretch out skin, and it keeps fluid retention in the face. Most people are not even good candidates. I would say about 20% of the population maybe is a good candidate for filler. When mm. you age, you know, your, your skin laxity is breaking down, collagen is breaking down, we're losing fat, we're, the muscle is starting to atrophy, we're losing bone. So yes, you want to revolumize, but things are also falling. Filler fills, facelifts lift. So when I talk to people, I say, well, what is it, you know, that's bothering you? Well, I just want to do this. And they usually take their fingers and they pull their face up. And I say, well, what are you doing? Are you filling or are you lifting? And they're like, I'm lifting. Oh, okay. You know, and then they kind of like have that like moment of, oh, okay, I get, I get it. <laughs> You've been doing this for such a long time. Have you seen a, a shift in the transparency of public figures or just people in general with regard speaking about their own plastic surgeries? You know, I think there's a stigma attached to a lot of it. Um, and I think that the tabloids created this stigma. Oh, you know, how dare she? She did plastic surgery, mm. surgery, did she or didn't she type of thing? Yeah. You know, it's always like one of these things that people, uh, people love to gossip. People love to be nosy. You know, this is the society we live in these days. People, this, this is why these, these platforms have taken off. You could just go into someone's page and see what they're doing and just be in their business, you know? Sure. Um, some people just are private and they want to keep those things private. And, you know, they don't want that attention, that negative attention from people because people are going to uh, turn it in another way. I think good surgery is good surgery is good surgery, no matter what. So when things are done well and you look at people like, oh, like she's 50 and she looks phenomenal. What is she doing? How dare she not talk about it? It's like, well, that's her prerogative. You know, it's her life. If she wants to be private, it's like, like don't damn or condemn the person because they just want, you know, choose to be private. I think that's right. silly and ridiculous. Um, they're under so much Agreed. scrutiny as it is. We know what paparazzi following them around all the time. They just want to keep maybe like they want to keep that part of their life a little bit more private. They just want to look good. They always have to be ready and they have to look their best on camera because everyone's watching them all the time. They don't want to talk about that process. It would be better if they did, you know, hey, it would make all of our jobs a lot better um, and easier. But, you know, I don't, I don't really, you know, judge them for not talking about it. And I could understand why. I, as a consultant, as an advocate, I always talk about my experience as I talk about the things I do and I don't do. Usually I'm like the shoemaker who has no shoes, right? So finally getting around to this breast lift after my boobs are down to my waist right now. But um I think that you know transparency from the professionals who work in the industry is really important. People who are looking good, and you know we need to talk about it for sure. Yeah. Um, what is it that you found surgeons can very easily hide from the public? That you're just by doing a simple Google search, you're not going to find these things. That the surgeons are hiding from the public. Yeah, or they're able to. They have the ability to. I mean. It, this stuff should not be hidden. You know, again, the laws are so archaic and dated. It, it needs to be challenged. Someone, you know, the lobbyists need to jump in and these need to be changed. There needs to be some type of law reform, reform in our industry because I think that the industry has changed. The industry has changed, especially with the rise of these platforms. You know, doctors are getting away and, and people who aren't even surgeons are getting away with doing some procedures that they shouldn't be doing. So there has to be some type of, you know, restrictions, there has to be stricter laws in our industry. And there's not. Um, so yes, there's definitely, you know, there's definitely these, these disconnects, I think, with with law and law reform, and people just haven't taken the time to, you know, go in and challenge them. 
Um, because doctors have to sign, or, or most people are asked to sign uh, an agreement to bind, to agree to bind, binding arbitration. Is it your understanding that almost all plastic surgeons are going to ask you to sign a binding arbitration agreement? Usually those are put into place, right? You should have an attorney review that and explain to you what that actually means. Um, in fact, you should do a podcast with a malpractice attorney to, to you know, break down that language for your audience. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. It, again, you know, knowledge is power. And I think that doctors think, oh, ignorance is bliss when it comes to their clients. So, you know, we need to not be ignorant as consumers. We want to be knowledgeable. We want to be informed consumers so that we can make informed and smart decisions for ourselves. But let me play devil's advocate for a moment. If that's the standard amongst all plastic surgeons, you're going to sign binding arbitration, not even just plastic surgeons, most doctors, most um, healthcare professionals, at least that I've new ones that I've gone to in the last couple of years, I've signed an agreement to binding arbitration. Um, right. So that tends to be the standard of care, which means if you're going to say, I'm not signing this, then you're probably not going to be treated by that physician, most likely. Um, Correct. You're not but do be you think that doctors it. should be uh, required to disclose if they are, I mean, how many binding arbitration cases they've had or how many medical malpractice lawsuits they've had, do you think that they should be required to disclose that? Well, should they be required to? I mean, the honest Abe's probably would say, hey, you know, I did have an incident one time where this and this and this happened. Listen, that's an honest surgeon. There's just not a lot of honest people in the world. Um, there's not a lot of honest professionals in the world. And that's sad. That's just yeah. sad. And that's unfortunate. Um, but like you did all your research and found and uncovered all these, these cases, um, most of them are very hidden. You know, you have to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig to find them because they try to, they hire reputation management um, consultants and people who do this for a living. Oh, okay, don't worry. You've got a bad reputation. I'm going to clear it up and make you look like a superstar again. You know, yeah, it's going to be $50,000 a month. And these guys will pay it because they're like, if I don't, bury this stuff. I'm it's doing one day of work for them, you know, you know with, regard, then, with regard to finding the cases, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to mention this with regard to finding cases, uh, medical malpractice cases against your particular surgeon, whoever it is you're looking at, you have to remember that because they all get their patients to sign binding arbitrations, that means the 99% of their clients who have a mishap or have what they believe is medical malpractice, they aren't going to be there isn't going to be a, a lawsuit. There's going to be a case of binding arbitration, which they do not have to report. It is not public record, even if there's a settlement, it's not public record. So if you see the doctor has tons of medical malpractice cases, you just have to assume that there is a mountain of cases with regard to binding arbitration with that physician. Correct. Run for the hills. You know, you Run just don't hills. choose that surgeon. <laughs> you don't choose that surgeon. Um, but again, people need to know where to go when these things arise. There are ethics committees for every board and every institution that the doctor is boarded with. You have to complain to the ethics committee. You know, you have to have corroborative information, detailed information with data, with facts, with other cases, with other people who you've spoken with. You have to gather all of that information and you need to send it to the ethics committees, the state um, department, the medical, um, I'm sorry, not the, the state medical board, mm -hmm. the Department of Health, the Office of Professional Medical Conduct. These are all places you want to go with these reports, with, with your case. And I'm going to link to those in our show notes. And I just want to encourage anyone who's listening or watching this to take the time to do that. I've talked to no less than 40 victims who, when I asked them if they reported it or if they even filed a, a review, I would say 98% of them didn't because they're like, I just figured I was the only one. Um, I didn't want to get sued or I went right. to the website and it seemed complicated. It felt like I had to fill out like all these forms and I just wanted to be done with it. And I just want to encourage people. I understand that, but please know that by not doing that, you jeopardize the safety and health and the results of every other woman who does and man who deserves to know that they who they're seeing is is actually credible. And when we when we don't when we take the easy way out or when we dismiss our own thoughts like oh I was the only one, we really do jeopardize other people's harm and their safety. Right. 
No, absolutely 100%. People are intimidated by surgeons. I had a woman come to me saying, you know, I had this facelift. It really wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And every time I went to the doctor, he, you know, basically gaslit me and said, oh, you look great. Like, this looks amazing. And she was afraid to speak up. And she's like, you know, I don't feel comfortable going back to him. And I'm afraid to really speak up and tell him that I don't like it. Why are you afraid? You have the power. You paid this person for a service. You have the power, not them. Okay. Speak up. You have to put it out there. You have to let them know. I am not happy. You need to fix it. If you are not going to fix it or you're not able to fix it, you're going to pay me back or I'm going to go and write all these reports about you. I mean, anyway, you should be putting reports out there. You know, the, the people should be aware. The boards should be aware. These ethics committees, they have like stringent rules and regulations. And every time a doctor is boarded with any institution, they have to sign off on those, the code of conduct, the code of conduct, the code of ethics. And they know what that code of ethics is. You know, they like to keep that hidden too. Again, ignorance is bliss. They don't want mm -hmm. people to know they've signed off on this code of <laughs> ethics. So, but yet they're getting away with murder over here. So it's yeah. you know, literally. Literally. Um, can you speak to the trend of people going out of the country, specifically to Mexico for complete mommy makeovers? What are your thoughts there? Are there good surgeons there? There are good surgeons everywhere. But, you know, again, if you're in the United States, you're covered here in the United States, especially when it comes to litigation. Um, you know, if you're going to another country, you're not really covered over there. So that's the problem with um, with the uh, the traveling for surgery or what do they call it? Uh, medical tourism. Oh, yeah. So, medical tourism. you know, I think that you're silly to go to another country. I mean, yes, there's phenomenal surgeons. You know, I have a lot of women come to me. I want this body sculpting. I saw this doctor in Colombia. It's again, the aesthetic style is different everywhere. You know, that that could be very in over there, that whole like curvy look, and they could be very good. There's great Brazilian doctors, there's great Colombian doctors. I'm friends with a lot of them. You know, they're always like, Melinda, come if you want to do any of this, come out here and I'll do it for you. I'm like, oh, there's great surgeons in the United States who do very similar work and they're fabulous here. So I'm probably going to stay in the US. I want to be close to home. I don't want to be traveling. Again, traveling also is taxing on the body after you've had all this surgery. You're up in the air, you know, a lot of swelling. It could cause a lot of issues. So I don't really like people traveling so far for surgeries like this, not unless you're going to be, you're going to stay put for a month or two. Some people are like, well, I've got five days. I'm going to go get full body 360 lipo and then I'm going to travel back. Um, also, the laws are different, you know, the laws for, for the um, for their OR. So there's, you know, they have certified ORs, JCO board certification and, and JCO um, compliance. Uh, they have the quad A compliance for, for if they have their own ORs. So there's mm -hmm. different rules and regulations that they have to abide by. And those rules and regulations and laws are different and that those compliancy rules and regulations are different from country to country. So they're not as strict in other countries where we've probably got the most, the tightest rules, regulations and laws for compliancy and OR compliancy here in the United States. Do you have any concerns with or recommendations with regard to seeing a plastic surgeon who has their own OR or do you recommend that you go to someone who's operating in a hospital? Right. It really depends on the case. Some cases require hospital. Um, what other would be a case that requires a hospital? Like these huge body lifts where you're doing a lot of cutting. If you're inducing a lot of bleeding, I have women who come to me with size P breasts that need a huge reduction. What and, letter did uh, you just say? P, size P cup. Yeah, we've seen them. Wow. Um, but the, it's a, it requires huge reduction, you know, and a lot of it could induce a lot of bleeding and you just want to be in a hospital setting for those types of cases. A lot of these other cases don't really induce a lot of bleeding. I mean, yes, abdominoplasties, but they're using cauterization. Mostly often they're using the cauterization. I mean, all, all the time they should be. Um, so usually an OR is sufficient enough. Every OR is required to be within a certain, um, distance from the hospital. So that's mm -hmm. why when you hear like in New York, you have your Upper East Side, you know, Park Avenue surgeons, because there's like Lenox Hill, Cornell, Mount Sinai, there's Columbia. So 
you have all these hospitals based up there. So that's why they kind of like park their practices around there. You'll find some guys downtown who are parked around NYU because they're affiliated with NYU, but they have to be within a certain distance of the hospital. Very interesting. And with regard to doing procedures on the front of the body and the back of the body, many of the women that I spoke to, as I think I mentioned to you, experienced um, areola necrosis. So they would do full, I mean, I can't even tell you how many women I have talked to who they went in for a breast lift. Um, they were, uh, scare tactics were used to tell them like, you need to do all these other things they, they would do a breast lift. And apparently he would do the breast lift first and then put the patient in a prone position and then do a back, um, lipo and BBL and whatever else he's doing. And they would be in a prone position for so long that many of them experienced again, this you know, dying of the tissue around the breast. Um, and I'm wondering if that, what you can share with me about that particular practice of doing both the front and the back of the body and, and then full body lipo and vaser and reju renuvion and uh, the tummy tuck and the thigh lift. He's doing like all these procedures on these very tiny women. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, 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 very dangerous. Um, most doctors, you know, if a, if a patient comes in saying, I want breast lift, I want circumferential lipectomy, I want BBL, I want liposuction. Usually you don't do that at the same time. Um, you have to phase them out usually in one or two, two surgeries, three surgeries, sometimes depending on the position that that patient's going to be in. And also the position they're going to be in when they're healing too. You know, usually BBL, you can't be on your back, breast lift, you can't be on your stomach. So you have to be really careful in how you carry out these, um, these procedures. It's really dangerous. It's really risky to do everything at once. Uh, usually it also it is compromising for blood supply to do all of those things at once. If you're doing excessive amounts of surgery in one area, like excessive amounts of lipo in the midsection and also an abdominoplasty that's going to disrupt the flow of blood to heal that large incision for your abdominoplasty. So, you know, it's uh, it cuts off your blood supply. We see this a lot, necrosis of the incision. He's stupid. I mean, he should have had one case go wrong and then said, oh, you know what? My mistake. I shouldn't have done all of that surgery at once. I should have practiced a little bit more of, you know, of a well, you know, thought and, and discernment and, and carrying out these procedures. And I should have, you know, not done all of that. I mean, again, I have my thoughts about this guy. <laughs> I know you're doing <laughs> probably going to listen to so this. Helpful. Shame on you if you are listening to this, if he's going to listen to this. I mean, you know. It's disgraceful. And doctors are, are diplomats. You know, you talk to other surgeons and they hear this stuff and they kind of roll their eyes and they're like, disgusting, disgraceful. But they'll never talk about it to a patient because they're professional. They don't like to, you know, bad mouth other professionals. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, I like to call people out when they need to be called out. But I love that again, about you. bad mouthing other professionals is unprofessional. You shouldn't do it. But when this stuff happens and it's happening in these numbers and this type of volume, no, something is very, very, very wrong here. Something is very wrong. Well, Melinda, I know you've got a lot of um, busy people who are waiting to do consultations with you. So I want to make the most of our time here. Can you share with us just kind of a general checklist, if you will, of the things that at a minimum you need to look into when you're considering plastic surgery? Right. So again, results important, background important, that their education where they did their residency, where they did their fellowship. Um, you, again, don't always want to go to a lot of these review sites because, again, you don't know whose best interest they have at heart. You could go to the state medical board. You could see if they have any lawsuits against them. Um, and going in and just interviewing them and having a good list of question for, questions for yourself, and I post this a lot on my page, the questions you should be asking during consultations. Um, you know, it's educational. I, I try to put a lot of educational content up there. Work with an advocate. Work with a consultant who's properly vetted these surgeons. And again, not to toot my own horn, but I feel like advocates, more advocates are needed. You know, by all means, if we have more professionals, nurses who've been in the industry for a long time who want to set up an advocacy for themselves, I'm all for it. As long as the proper people are in this position and they take it seriously and they're not looking at it for monetary gain, they're looking mm. at it for like benefit of the client. They care about people. They care about humans. They want to make sure that their clients are in good, safe hands. Your Instagram is such a great resource for everyone. I mean, it, I teach obviously Instagram marketing. And one of the things I always say is stay niched 
think about what type of content you can post that really helps your audience. And you do such a phenomenal job of that. When this oh, first happened to me, people were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you have to reach out to Melinda. Does she know about this? And, um, and, and I was just so overwhelmed with how um, much I've learned just since my surgeries about plastic surgery and the things I should have known. So I want to encourage everybody to follow you there on Instagram. Can you share with us your handle? Sure. It's at beauty broker official. And for people who are interested in booking a consultation with you, how can they do that? Sure. They could um, email us at hello at thebeautybrokers.com or Gianna at thebeautybrokers.com. That's my admin. She could schedule you um, and just try to reach out to us a couple of months in advance. Uh, usually <laughs> doctors are booked out about six months, right? Six months to one year right now. Some of these doctors have huge wait lists. Um, we do expedite some appointments where I'll put them in on my personal time, sometimes on the weekends, but I don't like to do that. I believe in life balance as do yeah, you, yeah. um, you know, I don't like to, to overwork, but I will, if it's, if it's urgent, I will put someone in. Well, thank you for what you do. I wish there were more people who are advocating for the patients. I'm going to make some big changes and I really appreciate this conversation and being able to help our our listeners understand that there, there are good doctors out there, but you do need to be an advocate for yourself and you've got to find someone who is an advocate for patients like you. So thank you so much you. for being with us. And they don't always exist on those platforms. So know that too. There's phenomenal surgeons who are, are not on these platforms and there's something to be said about that as well, but always happy Lesson to help learned. everybody. And anytime another advocacy comes along that I know is a good, you know, advocacy that vets surgeons really well, I'm always happy to give them business too because I can't possibly see everybody and we're so bad. So definitely uh, I look forward to working more with you guys. And thank you, Shaleen, for having me on. And again, I'm so sorry that you had this experience. Well, thank you. I appreciate that.